I want you to put your hands together and welcome with me my friend Nathan Blouse. We're glad that Nathan is with us from Safe Place Ministries. We're happy you're here today. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You can be seated. Amen. Thank you. It is great to be here. Uh, I am excited and I'm excited that uh, God can change us from the inside out. As a matter of fact, that is the process. I grew up in church where they said, well, it's got to get from your head to your heart. And the reality is, is it's the other way around. It's never going to get from your head to your heart because Jesus is on the inside working to the outside. So when you get an explosion in your heart where who he is is truth ministers to the experiential place of your heart. And that all connects, then your mind can start wrapping itself around it. Come on, are you here? So anyways, I lead a ministry called The Safe Place. And it is out of Dallas, Texas. So I'm not too far away from you guys. Normally I get on a plane, so this was nice to just drive an hour and a half and, and be here. Uh, it is a joy to be with you and your pastor. And I travel all over the country, and I just want to tell you, and I said this in the first service, and I mean this, um, I meet a lot of ministers, a lot of leaders. I can tell, I'm not saying I will be back, but I can tell when it's going to be a one and done and it's not going to be a one and done. And, and a lot of that is about relationship and who they are. And I'm telling you, you have the real deal leading you. Amen. Not just him, his wife, their family. Uh, Jesus is perfect. And that's good because that means we don't have to be. We're all work in progress, right? But how many of you know there's a lady that had a real powerful ministry to youth and her husband led the church out in Illinois. Her name's Jeannie Mayo. Uh, she has a statement that's really powerful. And she said this years ago. She said, if you want to make bread for others, you have to go through the flour mill yourself and be ground up. Come on, are you here? If you want to really make bread for others, and it's not about the production of your hands, it's about the fruit that comes out of your life, then you've got to go through some things and come out the other side so that not only you have something to share, you have an affinity and a, and a connection and a compassion and an empathy for where people are. And I'm here to tell you, in the little bit we've gotten to know each other, your pastor, in his life, in his walk, in his journey, he's been through a couple of grinders. So you're getting him at a good season in his life. There's a lot of fine flour there, rich, with, with, uh, with good things in it. Amen? Amen. Well, I know you guys are sharing this live. You guys don't know me. But I am, uh, I am recently engaged and soon to be married. And while I live in Dallas, my fiance lives in Phoenix, Arizona. And we do, did due diligence to make sure that she could see this today. And so I just want to thank her for participating with us. Uh, hopefully she'll be with me in the, in the future. Um, but uh, all kinds of good things. I want you to turn in your Bibles to uh, Romans 12.2. We will camp there. They're going to put it up, so I'm not going to read it right now. My ministry, like I said, is called The Safe Place. How many of you know that unless you feel safe, you can't open up and really be yourself? The Bible says the word of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous run into it and are safe. Now, that's the old testament the old covenant in the new covenant john says the word became flesh and dwelt among us we beheld him he he touched us he ate with us he was real with us he identified with us we were able to touch him he had bad breath i hope that doesn't demystify jesus for you but but the image that everybody had of who god was before he walked on this earth was not a good image. People thought God was angry with them. 
people still think God is angry with them. Not much has changed in 6,000 years. I was going through an airport one time and I've got this t-shirt that says, What is a grace culture? And on the back of it, it says, God is not angry with you. I thought that was just common theology. Man, I had two drive-by religious shootings happen. The religious mafia read my shirt and tried to drive by shoot me. They wanted to argue with me. They wanted their God to be angry. I finally said, listen, your God can be angry. Go sacrifice to your God. If he doesn't look like Jesus, talk like Jesus, act like Jesus, and walk like Jesus, it's not. Come on, are you here? We, for too long, have interpreted Jesus into the Bible rather than looking at Jesus and making the Bible line up with him. Come on, are you here? Jesus came bringing relationship. And that religion, and that relationship is a kingdom whose currency is love. Our kingdom is money. Some kingdoms is water. Some kingdoms is oil. His kingdom is love. So if you have this mindset in you today, this belief that Jesus is somehow waiting to drop the axe on you or the hammer on you before you go to bed at night, if you've got to go through a litany of all the things you did wrong and ask him to forgive you, if, if, if there's this fear that you have that any move you make, he's going to sneeze and turn you into ash. If everything I'm saying does not make any sense to you, praise God. But if he is anything in your mind other than who he is, then what I'm going to speak to you today is relevant. Because the reality is, is he, the word, became flesh and dwelt among us. And now if you say yes to that word and he lives inside of you. It's not we run into him outside here looking for a word to drop on us to try and get some kind of clarity. That's all nice. That all has its place. But the reality, folks, is the word is in you. The word, the living word, Jesus, he's a strong tower in here. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. You can run into that place of refuge inside of you and find safety, find peace, find rest. He is your safe place. Here's the, yeah, here's the problem. We all know that. We can get excited about that. I can feel a goose bump. Then I walk out of here, I get in my car, and in five minutes, I'm fighting with my wife or my kids. Where'd that ha, go? Listen, he didn't jump out of you just because you got in the car, and now you're going, hit rather than, hit. That's the dichotomy that we're all in. And that's why Paul writes here and that's why this is so important romans 12 2 says be not conformed to the patterns of this world be transformed by the renewing of your mind then or that in this passage that you may prove what is that good acceptable and perfect will of god i have lots of people come sit down with me one on one i say hey what are your hopes and expectations of our time together and they say i want to know what god wants me to do there's a this then that in this passage be not conformed to the patterns of this world be transformed by the renewing of your mind then You'll know. 
When? Then. Then when? Then when after you've not been conformed to the patterns of this world, but been transformed by the renewing of your mind. So listen, I'm here to tell you today, God wants to do mind renewal. People say, well, what exactly is this? Well, let me tell you, it's not deliverance because we're not looking for a demon behind every bush. I'm not saying they're not there, but we ain't looking for them. If I said, hey, we're going to do deliverance and I gave you a break, maybe half of you'd come back. Listen, I was in so much pain when I was growing up. I'd let anybody do anything to me to get out of pain. And I went to a deliverance session one time, and I had to get delivered from the deliverance session. I walked in freer than when I walked out. I'm not kidding. I had to call a friend and say, I need you to pray. I can't even think straight right now. I don't know what. They, they were calling stuff out. Must have been a demon walking by going, hey, somebody's calling my name. Let's jump in. I'm not saying they didn't mean well. I'm not saying they don't even help other people. It just didn't help me that day. And then, as pastor said, I don't know if it's this service or last service, if I called it inner healing, we'd all leave, go for our break, come back, all the men be gone. (laughs) Honey, you can get all you want of that inner healing. Bless God. Not going there. But if, and I'm saying this to you today, if I said that at the end of this we were going to pray and there's more than a likely opportunity that God wanted to renew your mind in some way, who's against that? I mean, if you're against that, I don't know what to tell you. And this is Pat Paul's Magna Carta, one of his big statements in Scripture. Be not conformed to the patterns of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you're going to know how to go, where to go, why to go. So let me tell you what that isn't. It isn't for somebody else and not you. Paul says, put it up there again, boys. Paul says, be not conformed. That be, there's, an, there's, a, there's an understood you there. Yeah. You be not conformed to the patterns of this world. Turn to your neighbor and said, that means you. You can't nudge your spouse on this one and get out of it. It isn't all women be not conformed to the patterns of this world, but be trained. It isn't all, unless you're 50. Be not conformed to the patterns. of the, It doesn't say, and anybody who has the title of a ministry gift is exempt. As a matter of fact, ministry gifts probably need to be up there more. <laughs> I know where I'm speaking from on that one. So we have to understand all together that this is your responsibility. There's no osmosis for this. You have to be intentional. And while I'm here and we're doing about, I don't know, 13, 15 individual prayer sessions while I'm here and we're lasering in on things supernaturally quickly to eradicate things from people's past and their lives and their memories and all this stuff, this is not an event Some of you have been to something that I was a part of the original things of because my home church is the bridge and Pastor Dwayne White. Back in the day, we I was a part of the original first couple of years of LTS. LTS is an event. It's a supernatural experiential training where you drink water out of a fire hydrant. Your mind blows off your head. You sit with somebody and your heart gets expanded. And it's awesome. And it's an event. But that is not the end, the beginning, or the end of mind renewal. It is not an event. It's a way of living. The reason I'm saying that is because we as a culture, not just as Christians, but as a as a culture in our nation are event driven. God is not event driven. He is process driven. 
He's in it for the long haul with you. As a matter of fact, the Old Testament idea of mind renewal is the refining of precious metal. Now, you all pretty much raised your hand. I need my mind renewed. Right? I mean, some of you weren't sure where we were going, so you ain't committing to nothing. I get how you are. <laughs> so I know where we're going. You want me to go there? <laughs> That's a whole nother message. Precious metal. So what happens is the heat gets turned up on this hunk of metal. Maybe your gold, maybe your titanium, maybe your platinum. The heat gets turned up and you, the real essence of you, liquefies. How many of you know when you're in the pressure cooker of life, it kind of feels that way? You turn into... Yeah. And you're wondering what's going on and everything feels out of control and your emotions are going everywhere. Whether they come out of you or you bury them inside, they're still there. Yeah. Don't think for a minute you folks that don't throw your emotions out there and get animated like me are exempt. Just because you look calm on the surface doesn't mean you aren't feeling it. And I'm kind of scared for you because there comes a day where there ain't no more wiggle room inside and you volcano. You know, you get back in the corner where you got no more wiggle room and it's been five years and, 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 and you done filled up past what you can fill up. Man, you come out with two AK-47s. You're lobbing C4 everywhere. You're telling me about five years of stuff I've done to you. And I've only known you for three years. And I mean, it's just lava everywhere. You're burning everything down. Now, that may only happen once in a blue moon. But let me tell you, I know it's in you. At least with me, you know where it's coming from every day. You may not like it. Come on. Can we be real today? So this, the impurities, they have to be seen. The, the dross is not dross in the sense of it till it comes up. These impurities got to come up through the liquefied you, not the solid you. If you stay solid, they stay in there. So the heat and the pressure is your spouse. I got real with a couple one time and told them what marriage really is. And they walked out and the woman came up to me and said, I don't think you should do marriage seminars. She said, I don't think anybody would feel good. Marriage is not ultimately about your comfort or your pleasure. It is the ultimate place of choosing to transform and look like Jesus. We need to start readjusting our expectations of marriage and maybe some of them would stay together longer. You are in covenant, which means this should be a safe place for me to be any way I am. I'm not saying disrespectful or abusive, or, but I should be able to totally get naked in front of you, not just physically, but emotionally. And I know that I have the security that you're not going anywhere. Listen, guys, don't compare your wife to your guy friends in your cave. Women, don't compare your husbands to the women that you hang out with and think if he'd just be more like them. We're not. That was kind of loud. We're not. <laughs> We're never going to be them. We don't think like you. You're going to have to tell me every time the list that I have to get at the store. Or if you text it to me, you're going to have to remind me that it's on my phone. I am not you. 
Now, it's another thing and another discussion if you do these things for me and I, and I buck you. But if your man is willing for you to take him by the hand <laughs> and let you help him, then you just keep helping him because he's not you. That's a good place for all the men to say amen. amen. Thank you, guys. <laughs> trying to help them. Try, trying, to, <laughs> trying to transform their minds, right? <laughs> that wasn't in the notes. I guess y'all needed that because I'm like so far off the reservation. That wasn't even in the first service. I... <laughs> Marriage is about ultimately a pleasurable experience. Marriage is about good thing married but marriage is work it doesn't come natural you are two completely opposite people I mean if you haven't physically looked in the mirror lately you're opposite <laughs> that goes into your soul that goes into makeup that goes into so why would you think this is going to be easy If we adjust the expectation, we may be able to breathe and have grace for each other. I'm just saying. Again, it's about changing your mind. It's about a renewal. It's about a transformation. Come on, are you here? Now I'm going to get back on this message because this wasn't a marriage seminar, all right? Contrary to what you feel right now. And listen, if I've offended you, I know a guy that can help you through that at the end of this message. We'll get you all back together and you'll be happy as you leave. So the Bible says do not be conformed. It involves you. It involves you being intentional. It is not an event. It is a process. And that means that you, the process means it's daily or weekly. So that means you have to be intentional in your relationship with Jesus. I didn't say religiously set a time to stare at the ceiling. You have to learn to be open in the process, driving down the road, just talking to him and connecting with him. And here's the dilemma. A lot of us can't do that or feel that or experience that because we haven't had enough mind renewal. We got all this stuff. We're like emotional hoarders. Be not conformed to the patterns of this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That renewing, I'm getting ahead of myself, but the renewing as a renovation of a house. The, re the renovation of your house is changing mindsets and emotional feeling about how we believe about ourselves based on those mindsets. So a lot of us have become emotional hoarders at 50 years old. You know, you're going through life... You're developing, this stuff's printing into you, particularly in the first 12 years of your life. By 12, you've got your own little YouTube video collection that you can subscribe to going on in there. Then you print in a little more in adolescence, and then you print in a little more as you go along. And then you get to 20, 18 to 24 when that last development stage hits, and now you're doing life, right? And you get to... 35, 45, 55, and the further along you go, the more physical stuff's happening. You can't sleep at night. Your back's knotted up. You're on different medications. And it's because you have hoarded your emotions in your house. The Bible says be in health and prosper as your soul prospers. Have you seen these hoarder shows? There's like this one track. And if you hit a pile of stuff, things move around in there. There's critters. I grew up with critter ministry. It was called deliverance. We're going to get rid of the rats. The problem is, being the rat patrol, rats are drawn to garbage. So if you've got emotional garbage hoarded up in your house, the rats just keep coming back. Get rid of the garbage, and lo and behold,
behold, there's no more critters. Imagine that. So be not conformed to the patterns of this world. Has to be intentional. Has to be daily and weekly. It's in the Lord's Prayer. Where's it in the Lord's Prayer? What are you talking about? Line four. And forgive those indebted to you. That's just a statement. It's about forgiveness, but it's actually about managing your own soul. And there's a lot more that goes to that. Did you know you can get stung today but not be offended until 10 days from now? Being stung is here. A festering wound comes later. There's been a lot of times I got stung by somebody. It went in. The logical part of me buried it. Because, you know, we try to live out of the logical part of us and push our hearts to the background. That's just the way we learn to live. And some of us are stronger at that than others. And I'll be driving down the road, and about three or four days later, I'm just feeling cranky, and I'm upset with the kids, and I'm flushing the goldfish down the toilet, and I'm kicking the dog, and I'm like, guess I better manage my soul. Because you know it's not all them, right? You know it's probably not your spouse. It's probably you. That, see, that's the, that's the joy of becoming more like Jesus in that refining process. That's not the joy. That's the pain. It's the grinding off. See, when those, that dross comes to the surface and then he scrapes it off, guess what? When he looks into the metal of your life, he sees him. And when he turns you out to the world, particularly your spouse and your kids, they get to see him now more than they ever did. The greatest compliment I got from my daughter three weeks ago when I was praying with her. She's 10 years old. She had a real painful memory stuck in her head. And I watched God walk that out with her and heal that and totally change that so that she was at peace. The greatest compliment I got after that is she looked at me and she said, Daddy, I want you to know that there's a lot of times I see Jesus in you. What do you want, sweetheart? Like, are you kidding me? Like, but that's work, right? That doesn't happen overnight. And so all this stuff that's in us, it's conformity. Conformity is with form, with shape. Do not be resembling or assuming the shape of someone else. I get a knock at the door. There's two skinny guys in slacks and white short sleeve shirts. I know exactly who they are and what they're going to say. Why? Because they're conformed. To the Mormon church. I got to tell you, though, I've never seen a fat Mormon. <laughs> I've never seen one of them boys walk up to the door and be nothing but skinny. I don't know if that's just they don't send the fat ones out or they just don't get fat because they're walking and biking. It kind of irritates me because if you hadn't noticed, I'm this pear shape. I probably need a session on that, Pastor. But I know what they're going to say because there's a conformity. They've fit themselves into a shape. I shut the door, go to walk away. I get another knock at the door. I open it up. There's two old ladies with buns on their heads and denim skirts. No makeup. They got their grandkids with them. Got their grandkids with them. They're holding cookies and literature. I know. I know. Peanut, is that what it is? Okay, not, <laughs> I hadn't looked close enough, you know. I was taught if it doesn't come in a wrapper, you're not supposed to take it at Halloween. So I didn't mean they were Halloween. I'm sorry. That just dovetailed to the wrong place. Can we edit that out of the... I did not mean that. I, my mind just... Oh, well, I'm undone. Hallelujah anyways. Guess I'm not coming back. 
but I know what they're going to say because it's stamped in them. Have you ever tried to put yourself in a form that doesn't fit? How about women? How about those spanks you wear? Oh, come on. Oh, I, I can't go there. Is that it? I, like the air just sucked out. What's he know about Spanx? How about those shoes that were like $100 and now they're $20 and, and they don't have your size, but it's a good deal? I'm going to put my foot in a size, one size, two, smell. What's, how you doing, honey? Uh, look at my shoes. Can't get no help here today. They even got Spanx for men now. Are you kidding me? Put that thing on and the pair looks like I'm 20 years old again. <laughs> hey! <laughs> what are you trying to say? I look at, I don't know about that. I no mushroom. I don't know about that. It's not comfortable to be in a form that doesn't fit you. And so when I was going through a healing time and a God changing the conformity of my mind into something else, all of a sudden I saw this visual picture inside and it was this stick figure guy. And I knew that that stick figure represented me. And all of a sudden I saw this hand go across this canvas with this brush and there was like this rainbow of colors splashing itself onto the canvas, right? And then I saw this stick figure trying to take all the color and stick it in his head and it'd shoot out his feet. And then I'd see him try to stick it into his feet and it'd shoot out his rear end. And so I'd try to stick it back and shot out everywhere. And I'm like, God, what are you showing me? And he said, this is you, Nathan. This is what you do with who I've made you to be. I never colored you in the lines. Quit trying to fit who I made you to be into something I never made you to be. He's saying that to some of you today. Quit pushing who he made you to be into something that doesn't fit. Where does that come from? That's a great question. It comes from this conformity. This resembling the shape or the likeness of something other than what you should. And where that starts is in your family of origin. I don't care how many of you don't want to blame your parents for things and how many of you don't want to look back. Listen to me. Your history is only your history when it's dead to you and all you do is remember it and it doesn't drive with you in the back seat of your car every day. And when you look in your rear view, you're seeing everything of your life live with you in the present. So while I'm not about being a victim and blaming everybody, I'm also not about ignoring things like it's not what it really is. I need to own me regardless of what's happened to me, and I can only do that if I let Jesus do something about it in me. And so we've got these places, these family gardens, if you will, these places of relationship where I was printed into that, unfortunately for me, I had no choice in and I had nothing to do with it in that way. Does that make sense? And the first place of conformity is your family of origin or your family garden that you grew up in. And then there's one right beside it. It's called your school garden or, fam or, or family of origin. And then there's another one for some of us right beside that. It's called our church garden. And that family of origin. There are spheres of relationship that printed into our lives and impacted us. And here's how this works. Not only is it about being wounded that you need to forgive. It's about these memories. And these clips, see your mind, your soul is so big and so amazing. We don't give it enough credit. God did because God resides in our spirit, all of God. You know, like the genie in Aladdin. Big genie, wee little bitty space. 
There's this big God that slung all the universes and he lives inside of us right in our spirit. He created you with a soul that could embrace all of who he is and experience him. Your soul is ginormous. Look, look, look. When the Gadarean ran to Jesus and fell down at his feet and, he, and Jesus said, who are you? And he said, I am legion for there are many of us. Scholars think that was a reference to like five to 15,000 because of the Roman times and that idea of legion and a platoon or a group. And so he said, hey, they said, hey, we don't, you know, send us somewhere. Don't send us into the desert. So he said, all right, go to the pigs. There were 2,000 pigs. Listen to me. It took 2,000 pig souls to entertain and house what one man's soul could do. You are huge. You are way beyond what you think you are. Because God created you to experience the fullness of Him inside. And so where we get tripped up is what we believe. And what we believe is printed to us in life experience. So if I pull a negative memory out of your past, which your logical day-to-day mind doesn't remember. See, that's the beauty of your logical, non-emotional part of you. It keeps going day by day. It goes to bed, wakes up the next day, doesn't remember a daggum thing. Problem? Your heart doesn't forget a thing. It's all there. I've had so many people sit down with me. We do all this stuff. We, we, I get to know them. Then I say, Jesus, what do you want to work on? You bring something up they didn't even talk about. Well, I didn't even remember that. I didn't know that was there. No, you did. Your heart holds it. It's just you've so not lived out of your heart, you don't know how it works anymore. And then, by the way, anger is not a personality trait. It comes out of your heart. So if you can be angry, you can learn how to that, out of that same heart to be kind and gentle. I'm just saying. It's all there. We just need to learn how to do it, right? So we've got this memory. Just one. It doesn't have to be a big one. It doesn't have to be a molestation, a rape, being thrown across the room, watching your dad beat your your mom's brains out, it can be as simple as I was standing in show and tell. Going to talk about my Hot Wheels or my Barbie doll. And these are all my friends. But something happened between when I got up and I stood here and I looked them all in the eyes. All of a sudden, they became something other than my friend. And this whole process became ominous. And I... to, st- uh, but, uh, uh, and then all of a sudden, everybody snickers and laughs. And I look for my teacher to help me. And I watch my teacher kind of cover their mouth, and and they're laughing. <coughs> and in that moment, I have a negative experience. Now that's not a big deal. A lot of people. A lot of people's parents would say, just get over it. What's your problem? That's a whole other message right there. But not that big a deal. Not like being molested. Not like being screamed at. Not like all the things that when I start talking about renewing your mind, everybody goes, well, I don't need this because I ain't been molested. I ain't been raped. I ain't killed anybody. Listen, folks, it's anywhere in your mind that as you live life in your adult living, Things come up in you and emotions come up in you that are different than the peace of God in your life. Some of us don't even know what we're feeling sometimes. So we call it anxiety and depression because we just don't know what else to call it. I'm not saying there isn't anxiety and depression. But we live in an emotional, upside down, backward, uneducated and ignorant society. And that's just the society. It's worse in the church. The church is a barren wasteland. I had a mentor one time that said emotions weren't part of the kingdom. I didn't know 
what to do with that. I'm like, Jesus seemed like he got emotional and he was bringing the kingdom. He cried. He, le- he yelled in a loud voice. He got a little upset at times, compassionate at other times. In the garden, he felt depression and anxiety so bad he wanted to die. It's all right there if you dig it out. He felt everything you feel, so you're allowed to have your emotions. They're yours. I don't care what your conformity told you. You're not a drama queen. It's the way God created you, and you're allowed to be that way. You just need to learn how to manage it. Guys, you that were told big boys don't cry, Jesus wept. Nothing wrong with crying. But if you believe crying equals weakness, you're never going to cry. Where does that come from? Your garden you grew up in. Right? Be not conformed by the patterns of this world. Be transformed. Transformed means turned into a whole new shape. Conform, trying to fit myself into a shape. Transformed. Turned into a whole new shape, a whole new structure. That is the renewing of your mind. What is this new shape and structure you're not to fit into? You're to, you're to change into, Jesus. That's why it's supernatural. You can't do that to yourself. Any more than you could heal a goiter on the side of your neck by yourself. Or you could grow your own leg out three inches by yourself. It's no different. It's supernatural when God heals something physically. It's supernatural when he transforms what's inside of you into a place of peace in his kingdom. Come on, are you here? Listen, this process that I'm talking about is, the word here is metamorphosis. It's where we get the idea or where science has come up with. You've got a caterpillar, you've got a chrysalis, now you've got a butterfly. We all know that, but do we really know it? Do we really know what's going on here? Because what happens when this caterpillar goes into this butterfly... What happens in this chrysalis is literally everything about the caterpillar goes away. It literally turns into a goo, a soup that is not in any way the caterpillar anymore. And there are these cells inside the caterpillar called imaginable cells. The conformity of our lives and our belief systems are printed into our imagination. There are these imaginable cells and these imaginable cells can become anything that they're told to become. So latent in the structure of the caterpillar is this new DNA of a, of a butterfly. But the caterpillar's got to turn into a soup and literally go away so that these imaginable cells can take the latent DNA in them and kick that in and begin to divide and shape and form so that the butterfly can appear. So when you're hurt, when you're offended, when you sit down with Jesus... In your day-to-day and week-to-week structure of living. The crystallis may not happen every day. But there will be moments as he's walking with you. Where he will spin a crystallis around you. And he will say, hey. You need to forgive your dad finally. No! Fine, stay in the crystals. And he's just going to keep loving you and loving you and proving himself to you until all of who you were out here comes into a goo. And that which is him in you 
can be recreated so that when you walk out, you look like him. Come on, are you here? You got this image in this print when you were molested as a little boy or a little girl. It's in there. And there's beliefs in there. I'm dirty. It was my fault. I wanted this. I'm a bad person. And you sit down with somebody like me and you go into the chrysalis. And I have you go there. And we forgive whoever that was. But we don't stop there because forgiveness is not mind renewal. Forgiveness gets rid of the infection of what happened to you. But now God's got to do surgery on your mind. And I can tell you that you're a good person. And you can look at you with scriptures on three by five cards painted all over your life. And you can declare you're a good person. But when you go to have intimacy with your spouse, you become a bad person. Because that moment triggers the program that was printed into your mind like a computer and it starts to run and you start to shut down and you start to feel dirty even though there's nothing dirty about it even in your conscious mind you know there's nothing dirty about it but this program comes to your present living and now there's a problem so we sit down and Jesus takes you to that place and he begins to speak to you what the lies you believed about yourself. And he doesn't stop there because he loves you and he's a good counselor. And it's not like when you go to counseling and you tell your story and all this stuff comes out and you walk out and you're all raw and you're all wide open, but nothing's changed, but at least you've got some relief. No, he takes it one step further because he wants to transform you. He wants to take you out of this image that you thought you were and he wants to change you into a whole new image and so he doesn't leave you there he's not giving you truth he is the truth and he talks to your small t truth of what you believed and the lies you believed and he speaks to it as capital t truth and his big t truth wipes out your small t truth and he says there was nothing wrong with you it wasn't your fault you didn't deserve this you're not dirty you're not the problem the perpetrator was the problem and because it's him in truth experiencing that with with you, you change in this cat crystalis. You are transformed. So you walk out of here and you, there's something happened. The program's not there anymore. And when he's done with most people, if this situation is going on, not only do you feel free, not only do you feel at peace, you can't even access the memory anymore. The perpetrator's not even in it. Most people, there's just an empty room. The kid's out of there and he's with Jesus in a safe place in their own heart and their own mind. That is supernatural mind renewal. You can't do it. I can't do it. But there is one called the Christ, the Son of the living God, who takes away the sins of man. He said when it's finished, it's finished. And now he's walking it out in your life. Hallelujah. I can't preach that any better. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And he does the same thing with the memory. Were you embarrassed? As a little boy or girl doing show and tell. He does this. Over and over and over. He wants to renew your house. He wants to take all this emotional stuff. That you hoarded up in your house. And, and bring one of those big long green dumpsters up. And he's not even going to ask you to help him. He's just going to say, sit there and watch what I do. You've been trying to do this all by yourself all these years. You're all worn out. You're all thistles and thorns. But I want to change you into what I've desired you to be. See, this, this idea of transformation. There's only three other times in scripture this word is used. Two of them are at the Mount of Transfiguration. One of them is in 2 Corinthians 3 when it's talking about his glory. At the Mount of Transfiguration, that transfigure is the same idea as in this catalyst. When he was on the Mount of Transfiguration, he was giving them a prequel to what was coming out of the cross. Come on, are you here? 
And this transfiguring is the transformation because when we walk out of this chrysalis, people go, I know you're you, but you're not you. Something's changing. And, and the people that say that to you first, if it's really changing, is your spouse. They know. You can say all you want, but when you start acting different and don't even have to say it, come on, are you here? Your kids know. They ain't walking on eggshells anymore. But let's just back one up. Some of you come from houses where there was no emotional connection. It may as well would have been being in a hospital or a doctor's office waiting room. It's not just about what's negative that hurts you. It's about what wasn't there that hurts you. We always focus on all the negatives in terms of what got committed to your life in pain. But there's a, there's a concept that some of us need to understand. It's not just what got committed to our lives in pain. It's what got omitted from our lives in good emotional connection. That doesn't create wounds. That creates voids and empty places inside of us that we can't figure out how it got there or where it came from. Because this happens every day of your life. It's not just one time in an event where a knife went in and created a big wound and you're bleeding out every time that knife gets hit. No, this is every day of your life. Your heart wasn't held. You weren't loved on. You weren't made to feel safe. And you don't know that until you get out on your own because you're developing. You don't have a program in your head that goes, hey, tell your parents they didn't love on you today. There's not a program that goes, hey, warning. You need to tell them they need to tuck you in at night, tell you a story, love on you, play with you. Hey, they're not getting down in your world enough and helping you understand the world and caring for you. Hey, tell them your love language is physical touch. They need to hug you more. Hey, tell them your, your love language is words of affirmation. And, and rather than be critical and tell you everything you're doing wrong, you need to jump up and say, hey, tell me everything I'm doing right and help me with what's going wrong. Boy, wouldn't that have been great if those programs were there? But they're not. So it's not just what people did to you. In some of our lives, we would say, I have great parents because they provided, there was food on the table. But if I get to know you, there was no emotional connection. They were withdrawn. They didn't show emotion. They didn't connect to your heart. And that's why you have trouble. And it is. It's, it's not because anything overtly negative happened. It's just you lived in an emotional vacuum, and that creates its own damage. So a lot of people say, I, I can't hear God talking to me. I can't connect with God. That's because he connects with you through your emotional heart. And if your heart is so full of emotional junk that you can't even walk through your own house, how do you expect God to connect with you? Does that make sense? So today as we close, I just want to walk you through three or four prayers. that hopefully are going to lift things out of your heart. We're going to corporately, obviously, I can't sit with you like I would one-on-one -on -one and go detailed into some of these deeper memory things. That's a one-on-one -on -one neuroscience experience. Right now we're going to do a family practice healing. And if it goes the way it went this morning in the 9 a.m., a lot of you are going to leave with a lot less in your emotional house than what you walked in with. So let's bow our heads. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, right now, literally from today, the whole way back through your sons and daughters' lives, wherever we need to go, would you bring one person that they need to forgive up in their hearts and minds right now? Another way of saying that, Lord, is if somebody from their lives walked into this room and they had anything other than calm or peace towards that person, would you just walk that person through the door of their mind right now? Maybe they're actually even in the room with them right now. Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a, a child. 
Maybe it's a parent. God, maybe it's themselves and maybe it's you. Maybe the hardest person to forgive is themselves. They're blaming, regretting, resenting, beating themselves up. They're their own God, their own taskmaster, their own punisher. And maybe it's you, God. Maybe they need to forgive you. Maybe they believed, maybe they hoped, and maybe what they prayed for didn't come to pass. And their heart is hurt, it's sick, it's disappointed, and they need to forgive you. Whether somebody's come up in your heart and mind, whether somebody walked through that door, I want you to all pray this out loud. It doesn't need to be loud. But you opening your mouth may give somebody the courage to open theirs beside you that really needs to let go of some things today. Let's pray this together. Jesus, by an act of my will, I choose to forgive this person, myself, you, God, for these things that hurt me, that wounded me, I forgive myself for the things I'm blaming, regretting, resenting, and beating myself up about. I forgive you, God for not meeting my expectations when I believed. And I release all these things to you, Jesus, with all the hurt, all the pain, all the anger, the rejection, the disappointment, the guilt, and the shame, and all the weight these things have carried in my heart and mind and I let it go now Jesus show each one of your sons and daughters whether in thought or in picture bring to mind in each one of your sons and daughters one place where they're carrying something as a burden or a care that you've never asked them to carry bring that situation up in their hearts and their minds maybe it's a business owner and they're carrying the weight of their business maybe it's maybe it's a marriage maybe it's financial difficulty we have a lot to do in this life lord but you've never made us to carry the weight of life show each one of your sons and daughters one situation one place that they've assumed ownership emotionally of that thing of that situation let's pray this together Jesus by an act of my will I choose to release this situation these circumstances this burden this care I release it to you with all the weight that it carries all the stress, all the anxiety, I release it all to you, and I let it go. You carry it, and give me the grace and the peace to do what I need to do while you carry it. One more. Jesus, would you show each one of your sons and daughters one person that they've allowed to climb up on their shoulders and they're carrying them and they're carrying the emotional weight of their lives without any ability to do anything about it. Maybe it's a parent, maybe it's a spouse, maybe it's a child, maybe it's employees. They used to be a person, but when they climbed up on their shoulders, now they're a monkey around their neck and there's just this big weight that they're carrying in that person. Again, God, you haven't made us to carry people. You've made us to do things in people's lives. So let's pray this together. 
by an act of my will, I choose to release this person, these people, and the weight of their lives, their attitudes, their actions, their reactions, their words, their decisions, and all the weight of them. And I let it all go. Not holding on to them anymore. Give me the grace to do what I need to do while you carry them. Now I want you to open yourselves up like you're in worship. Now that he's taken out this emotional garbage and he's created room in your house now he wants to speak truth to that place in your house he wants to bring the peace of his kingdom in that place and fill that area in your heart so Jesus right now what's the truth you want each one of your sons and daughters to know what do you want them to feel what do you want them to sense what do you want them to see Lord minister to each one of your sons and daughters, Lord, however they're wired to connect with you inside. If they're thinkers, give them a thought so that they can think about the things that you want to say to them. If they feel inside, just bring your love and your care and your safety and your concern. If they're visual, give them a picture of what you want to say to them and then minister to that to them. 